But I would like to talk about a point that you brought up in the middle and you worked in a little bit, and that was the issue of keeping the law and those that believe that we should return to keeping the law. So before I make any comments on that, I do want to try to be fair to, um, I know we all do, we want to be fair to those that see it that way. I understand, I think I understand their point of view. Um, and so I want to try to fairly represent the positive side of what they're doing. So when you have these Christians, and I believe that the ones I'm speaking of, I'm not speaking of the those that are not that I consider to be apostates or heretics. I'm speaking of those I think are are true Christians, born again believers, who have who have gotten confused on the matter of the law. Mm-hmm. And there's a and there's some positive sides to what to this position that they have. The main one is that they want desperately for the Old Testament to be taken seriously. And I think they, they feel that the Old Testament, and amongst evangelical Christianity especially, has not, is not taken as seriously as it should be, and that it's allegorized beyond recognition, that it is used as sermon illustrations, basically, and that it's clear um, enjoinders, it's clear commands, are not taken that way anymore, and so they they want that to they want it to be taken seriously, and I think that's completely legitimate concern, and I do think that the Old Testament is not taken seriously enough by by New Testament believers, mm-hmm. like we see that it is when you look at the way Paul preached and Jesus preached, and they, they went to the Old Testament and they they demonstrated or they upheld their doctrines by showing through the Old Testament scriptures what they were saying, like Jesus on the road to Emmaus, he says that he, he, he went through all the way through the Old Testament and showed who the Messiah was going to be. And so they see that, and they, I think they want that, to, very desperately want that to, the Old Testament to be taken seriously. So that, that's, that's, that is commendable, in my opinion. In doing so, they have completely missed the point of the law. They have not understood the law. And this is what, to me, is so sadly ironic. So they want the law, the Torah to especially, to be taken very seriously, and yet they've completely misunderstood it at the same time. Absolutely misunderstood it, which is what Paul observes in Galatians. And it's what he, it's the, it's kind of the philosophical um, approach of Romans and the Hebrews passage that you read, along with others in Hebrews, it is the philosophical um, texture to that. And what his observation in Galatians was, that these people who want to be under the law do not understand the law. Now, Paul, I think, needs to be understood when he's saying this. It comes across a bit, um, could come across a bit uh, sanctimonious or even, or even mocking. And while I do think that there is like a, tone there of that, that can, you can read into that. It sounds a little bit like that. You have to understand at the same time, Paul is at the same time, I think, saying, saying, I was there too. All right. I didn't understand the law either. So it's not just that he's saying you want to be under the law, but you actually ever never even read the law itself. I think he's going a little further than that. And what he's saying, I think is, is that just as he also at one point who thought he knew the law did not understand the law, He's saying, you don't either. You don't understand what the law is about. And so I want to I just make some brief comments on this because I think this is, this is an important point. So you brought, up, you brought up where it says that we are not under the bondage of the law. And those that, would, those that believe that Christians should be keeping the, the, the law of Moses or the law of God or the Ten Commandments, however you want to denominate it, but to believe that we should be keeping this Old Testament law to whatever extent your personal conviction is. Because, you know, some, some people believe nine of the Ten Commandments, others ten of the Ten Commandments, all 618 or whatever it is. There's different ways. It's fine. If you think we should be keeping, Christianities are compelled to keep the Old Testament law, you probably take issue with the, with the representation that the law is bondage. And it's because, I think, that you don't understand the law and you don't understand the bondage that Paul is talking about. And at the same time, I think that Christians who reject the idea of keeping the law also don't understand 
what bondage we're actually talking about. So many of you might think, if you're, if you're more like on from the perspective that I am, that Christians should not be keeping the law, then you might think that the bondage of the law is the keeping of the law itself, which is how it's often represented by Christians. It's like, we're free. Christ has given us liberty. We are not under bondage, which means I do not have to keep the law. You think that's the bondage. You think the bondage is the keeping of the law and that the freedom is not having to keep the law anymore. And that's a mistake. And those that would believe that we should keep the law as Christians are quick and right to point out that that is a mistake. And it is. Now, they don't understand what the bondage actually is. And they go... They, they, they twist themselves into, into logical knots to try to make the bondage to be something other than what it is as well. So what is the bondage of the law? The bondage of the law is the death that accompanies the law. That is what we've been made free from. Christ had no intention of making you free from commitment or free from responsibility or free from duty, or free from commandments. The idea that the freedom that Christ gave us was freedom to no longer to have to obey something is a, is a terrible mistake. It is a complete misrepresentation. There is nothing in His words that would ever lead you to think that. This is what Paul says in Romans when he's dealing with this issue in an extremely nuanced way that almost all sides of the issue overlook. They Almost all sides oversimplify it to their preference. Paul looks at this from an extremely nuanced view. At one side, in one point, he's saying the law is, 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 is death, and at the same time, the law is spiritual, just, and good. And it's like both sides want to grab the portion that fits them best, and they don't want to acknowledge that what Paul is trying to teach you is that this is a very complex situation, and it requires a very nuanced approach in order to fully comprehend it. And, by, and those that don't understand this nuanced approach will, will believe that the bondage that they've been made free from is a bondage of commandments, a bondage of obedience, a bondage of of, sub, of being subject. And Paul says, no, that is not at all it. In fact, Jesus Christ said that if you love him, you will keep his commandments. There is nowhere in the scriptures where Jesus promises some antinomian freedom, some freedom from, from, from any type of rule or law or commandments. That is not at all what the freedom is about. And so those that would have us keep the law of Moses are quick to point that out, and they're right in pointing that out. They're accurate in that assessment, that the freedom of the law, the freedom of Christ is not freedom from obedience. It does not mean that now you're free to make up your own law and to go back to the time of the judges, let's say, and, and do what is right in your own eyes. Absolutely not. That is anti that is against the gospel. That is antithetical to Christ's teaching. And that is not what Paul teaches in, Go in Romans at all. Not at all. However, it is also not the freedom to keep the law. And this is very important for you to understand because Paul, in the book of Romans especially, through chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, lays out a very complete, a very full argument as to what the problem with the law is and what that bondage in, is exactly. And what he lays out is that there are a number of serious problems that the law has. The Old Testament law is not perfect. It has some serious problems. The principal problem of the Old Testament law was that it was co-opted immediately. Now, this isn't how the law was designed. The law, much like the original creation in Eden, was designed, and when God looked at it in its original design, said it is good, spiritual, just, and holy, like he looked at creation on Eden. When he had finished creation, God looked at creation and said, it is good. And it wasn't very long until all of that was good had become bad. And it wasn't because the design was bad is because creation had been co-opted. 
This is what Paul says has happened with the law. God made the law, and when he looked at the law, he said, it's good, and it was good. Everything about the law innately, inherently, is good. There is nothing evil in the law. But the law, Paul said, was co-opted, and it became the executioner for sin. He says, Paul says, that without the law, sin had no power, had no strength without the law. But when the law was given, sin all of a sudden had a strength that it didn't have before and that it could, it could send forth the law as its executioner to put to death those who were sinners. Now, that was never the intent of the law. Paul makes this clear in another passage. The apostle says that the law was intended for life. The promises of the law are promises of life. And those that think that Christians should keep the law are very quick to run to those places and point out the life design of the law. The design of the law is life. They're quick to point that out. And they're accurate in pointing that out. But they're incomplete. That is not the full picture. If you trace the history of the law beyond its original design, and we look at what the actual reality is of the law, just, just a few moments later, God gives the law on Mount Sinai in the form of the Ten Commandments. Moses comes down from the mountain with these tablets of stone in his hands, and when he gets to the bottom of the mountain, the law had been co-opted by sin and results in death that quickly. The bondage from which we've been made free is the bondage of the death that the law results in. Now, in order to be free from that death, something had to die. So if you examine Romans chapter 7 in light that it is a, a concluding illustration of the points that he has been making abstractly through 4, 5, and 6, and you look at this as being a tangible illustration of how this plays out, then I think you can understand it very easily what he's saying. So Paul paints an illustration drawn from the law itself, which is very interesting how he does this. So he takes from the law itself and he, and he draws an illustration as to what was necessary to happen in order for you and I to have the freedom from the bondage of sin and death. And that required something to die. Because Paul's illustration is marriage. That as long as the husband and the wife are both alive, the marriage is bondage for both. And then in order to be free from a bad marriage, somebody has to die. Now, there's a number of ways that this is actually illustrated in the Scriptures. In some places, it is we who die in the illustration, but not in this one. In this one, the illustration goes, to put it very simply, goes like this. The law is our husband. We are in bondage to that. Christ is the better husband to which we wish we could be wed. But in order for us to be legitimately married to Christ, the first husband has to die. And that's what Romans chapter 7 lays out. That the law was put to death, not because the law itself was bad, but because the marriage was bad. There was a problem in the marriage. And that the better marriage, the one we should want to have, is a marriage to Christ in which we are in bondage to Christ. But we cannot be in bondage to Christ unless we're free from the law. Those that believe and think, well, if I'm a Christian, then what harm can there be in keeping the law? Well, in practice, none. But in doctrine, all the harm in the world. Doctrinally, you are not understanding what the law actually is. You are, in Paul's words, you have not understood the law. The law as it was given is like a marriage. 
And you cannot be of both. You either are of Christ or you are of the law. This is what the passage that Mike read in Hebrews is talking about. There are two mountains. And you are either come to one or you are come to the other. But you cannot be of both. You are either born of Hagar or you are born of Sarah. You are of the law or you are of the promise. And you might think in all of your wisdom that you can do both. But the scriptures are very clear that that is not the case. And that the only way we could be of Christ is if, as Paul taught in Colossians, Jesus Christ took the law, the ordinances that were against us, and killed them on the cross. Jesus Christ accomplished a great deal of things on the cross. He slew death and sin and Satan. All of these things met their demise in Christ on the cross. But he also slew the law. And I know that runs contrary to what is intuitive. It runs contrary to the way some people think about it. And they don't think that that's what he's saying. But they have to twist his words beyond recognition for them not to say that. Because that's what it says. Read Romans chapter 7. Take Romans chapter 7. Read it through. And let it say what it actually says. Even if it goes against everything that seems intuitive to you. And what he is saying is that the law is the first husband. That has to die so that you can be wed to Christ, so that you can be joined with Christ. We can, this is not a matter of not taking the Old Testament seriously. This is taking it so seriously that we understand that the only way we can be of Christ is if there is something dramatic and drastic that takes place that frees us from that union that we had under the law in order to have a more perfect union with Christ. We have to leave Sinai if we want to inhabit Zion.